Well, a few years ago, I was um, chatting, uh, chatting with my friend Sarah, and um, we sort of got talking about, you know, spiritualism and, and uh, the supernatural and what have you. And uh, she told me about a time that her brother, um, they used to live down sort of um, Hornchurch Way, I think, and um, her brother was out walking the dog. And um, they got round, they were going through the fields, and they got to the back of where the, the spiritualist uh, church was. And the dog just sat down and refused to go any further. Um, and, you know, he, he'd had to go back home another way. It just would not go past the, the, the spiritualist church. And you think, well, what do you make of that? Could the dog see something or sense something which, which we can't? Um, you might think of, um, you know, Shakespeare fans, you might think of Hamlet. Uh, he says, uh, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And more things in heaven and earth than we, we usually talk about. But I think we have a, um, people in, in this country, and I think in Clacton, have a, a, a fascination with the, the supernatural. I remember being struck by that when we moved to Clacton um, about uh, seven years ago. You know, the spiritualist church here, um, there are, if you go to the, the pubs, the Albert Edward Hall, they have um, psychic nights. And um, uh, I see on, online, on social media, on Facebook, quite often people are talking about having readings, palm readings and things, um, people talking about mediums, and it's all quite open. And it seems that people... Uh, around here, but I think more generally, I just fascinated by by the supernatural. Now, what do we make of it as as Christians? What does the Bible have to say about it? Is it just a bit of harmless fun, or is there something more deeper uh, going on? And this is where I think the Book of Acts is really helpful to us because Acts does talk about this, this subject quite a bit and this is one of those passages in Acts, in Acts chapter 13 verses 4 to 12 which talks about it and we're going to return to this topic a little bit as we go through um, the book of Acts so it's, it's worth spending a bit of time thinking about because it is a popular topic so what, what does this passage have to say to us today about, uh, about the supernatural? Well, um, it starts out with Paul and Barnabas being sent by the Holy Spirit to, uh, to Cyprus. And I think that's a good place to begin, isn't it? Remembering that we, as Christians, we do believe in the supernatural. We believe in God. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and we believe that he is working and active in the world today. And they were sent to proclaim the word of God. It says in verse 5 there, they proclaim the word of God in the Jewish Synagogues and, and John was with them as their helper. Uh, so that was their mission, to proclaim the word of God. And that's what uh, the Holy Spirit helps them with, leads them with. And they come across this, um, this man who is described as a Jewish sorcerer. Now a sorcerer, um, you might think, uh, I mean, sorcerer. Do you remember that, that programme, was it Merlin, a few years ago? And... Um, you know, the King Arthur and everything, and you might think about something like that. But I think a sorcerer in, in, in these terms is a, um, someone who is a, like a magician, you know, uh, but not, not using tricks, but using actual kind of, you know, the supernatural uh, magic. Maybe if he was around today, he would be advertising himself on Facebook as a psychic medium. Who knows? Um, but the, the bit which is... Um, I think we're supposed to go, huh? Is, is he described as a Jewish sorcerer? And you think, well, that's a contradiction in terms. It's like saying someone is a Christian atheist. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense because sorcery was forbidden in the Jewish law. So in, a, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, from verse 9, it says this. When you enter the land, your Lord, uh, the Lord your God is giving you. Do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. That no one will be found among you who sacrifices a son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. 
Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. So it was forbidden under the, the Jewish law for someone to engage in these kind of spiritist practices, to be a medium, to cast spells, all of these kind of things, whatever it was that this sorcerer did, it was forbidden. So how could he be a Jewish sorcerer? There's, there's, it's, it's an impossibility. And he was also, it says, a, a, a false prophet. So maybe that gives you a bit of a clue that he was setting himself up as a bit of an authority. He was saying, well, I've got the answers because I can do all of these magic things. You know, listen to what I have to say. Listen to me because, you know, my, my power demonstrates my authority. Maybe that was, maybe that was what he was saying. And he, he seemed to be listened to. He was an attendant of the, uh, the proconsul. And um, he was uh, the proconsul, of course, with the chief of the whole island. Has anyone been to Cyprus? A few people have been to Cyprus. Yeah, I, I think Paphos, I think old Paphos um, is where Paul was. Um, I'm not sure what it's called now, but I think it still exists. So it's interesting to go around and look at these Bible places. Um, and the proconsul wanted to hear the word of God. And this man, by the way, was called Bar Jesus. So as, as Pam was saying, actually, just a, a minute ago, that just means um, son of, Bar means the son of. So it's the son of Jesus, or the son of Joshua, that he was called. That was his, uh, that was his name. But that wasn't all his name. That's another slightly puzzling thing. As we come into verse 8, it says that um, Elimas the sorcerer, for that is what his name means. So he was called Elimas. He had two names, Bar-Jesus and Elimas. And Elimas is the name that means sorcerer. What's the significance of that, having the two names? Come back to that. Hold that thought. And what he did is he tries to oppose the proconsul, tries to oppose the word of God. But Saul, who was also called Paul, So again, we have this name change. Saul, who was called Paul, um, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, comes from God. He looks at Elimus and says, you are a child of the devil and the enemy of everything that is right. Child of the devil. What was, what did the name by Jesus mean? It's Paul's diagnosis of what what Elimus really was, was different to, to his own. He says, you're a child of the devil pretty damning indictment of him really isn't it and he says you're going to be blind for a time now think back think back in Acts who else was made blind for a time in Acts Paul as we as actually the children said a few minutes ago from Acts chapter 9 Paul was made blind for a time in Acts because he opposed the word of God so it's fascinating isn't it how we're getting these kind of the two men Two similar things happening. And so Paul says it. You're a child of the devil. You'll be blind for a time. And it it says immediately mist and darkness came over him. And he groped about uh, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And and that's what it says in Acts. Chapter 9. Paul needed someone to lead him by the hand. Uh, And um, the proconsul, he sees what happens. And he believes because he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord So you think what what Paul did must have looked like an impressive bit of sorcery if you you think about it from the proconsul's perspective. Now Paul says, well, you're going to be blind for a time, and he was. And presumably that was more than anything that Elimas used to do. Whatever he did, it was probably, you know, pretty small stuff. But it must have looked pretty impressive. But who was the one who really did it? It was God and the Holy Spirit who actually who actually does it. It wasn't Paul. It was it, it was God. And the proconsul was amazed at the teaching. And um, it just made me think actually of um, what Paul says in, in one Corinthians two verse four. He says, "My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power." So that actually. Paul's words are backed up with with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and it's obvious to the proconsul that who is the one with the power and the, the authority. And it's not Elymas, but it's Paul. So let's uh, take a little minute now. Just to, I think the key in this passage, as we've seen, as we've gone through, is these contrasts between, between Paul and Elymas. And I think that is, um, that is key to understanding what this passage is saying to us about, um, uh, about what it means. Saul changed his name to Paul. You know in the Bible that people often change their names. Don't you think of Abraham, changed his name to Abraham. Think of Jacob and Isaac. Think of Simon and Peter. You can think of lots of people who've changed their names. And it usually indicates a new identity. And you know that uh, the Christian name, you might, we use that phrase, a Christian name. That's because in the past, if people, someone would become a Christian, they would take on a new name. And that's why we use that, that phrase sometimes. Um, so it's a new name, is a new identity. So Paul had got a new identity in Christ. But what about Elymas, who was by Jesus? Now Elymas. He was the son of Jesus. Now a sorcerer. And that says something about his identity as well, doesn't it? Paul had gone from being Jewish to, to being a Christian. Had gone from trusting in the law to trusting in Christ. But uh, by Jesus had gone from being, being Jewish to being a sorcerer, trusting in this kind of pagan, superstitious uh, religion. Paul proclaimed the word of God. Elymas opposed the word of God. It says something about what uh, relation these religions have with the word of God. And um, Paul was a child of God. Elymas was a child of Satan. Paul was powerful in God. Elymas couldn't do anything to stop what was happening. And both men were made blind for a time. Paul's, his blindness led him to repentance. But with Elymas we don't know. It's left open-ended. It's left open-ended. We don't know what happened to him. So what do we make of all of this? Well, Paul represents Christianity and Jesus. And Elymas represents the occult and these kind of pagan, superstitious, supernatural uh, religions. Now which one would you choose? It's, it's pretty obvious, isn't it, reading that, which one that, that we should choose. But the thing is that we face this choice every day and it may not be between um, Jesus and the occult perhaps that's not a temptation for us but it's always we're faced with the choice between Jesus and other things you know, we, we face the choice to trust in Jesus or trust in other things every day but let's think just for a moment just specifically about, uh, about the occult just as we're coming, coming towards the end what does this passage say about that? Well, the occult is forbidden by God, as we saw from that passage uh, from Deuteronomy. But why? Why is it forbidden? You think about someone who is into horoscopes or someone who is into to palm readings. What, does, what do they want out of reading the horoscope, looking at the, uh, the palm reading? Some insight into the future, maybe. Some insight into a situation, maybe guidance is what they're looking for. But the thing is, who holds the future and who gives us guidance? Well, it, it's God, isn't it, who, who holds the future? It's God who gives us guidance. You know that hymn, I know who holds the future and he'll guide me with his hand. With God, things don't just happen. Everything by him is planned. And, and so we're supposed to look to God for those things. Or what about mediums? Now, what does someone want who goes to a medium? Well, perhaps it's because of missing um, a loved one who is, who is deceased, of missing someone and wanting to, to have comfort uh, by knowing, knowing something about them, having a message from them maybe. But when someone dies, whose hands are they in? And again, it's in God's hands, isn't it? 
And that's really the problem with, with the occult, with this kind of um, uh, pagan superstition, which is that at the end of the day, you can't bypass God, that they're an attempt to get something apart from God, to circumvent God, to, to go round him in order to get what we want. And you can't do that. You can't co-opt the supernatural for, for our own ends. That's not, not the way to do things. And that's why these things are forbidden. Now, if you'd like to read um, a book which goes into this in a bit more detail from people who've got experience of, of why this is important, then I've got a couple which I can recommend. I've got one here with me. And this is a book called Devil on the Run by Nicky Cruz. So you might know Nicky Cruz from that, the book and the film, uh, The Cross and the Switchblade. And uh, he wrote a book about it called Run Baby Run. But his history, he had a background that his father was a kind of spiritual healer, uh, on a, I think on um, Puerto Rico. And, um, and of course that influenced him. And um, it, it had quite an influence in the family. And you can read all about that in this book. You might also be interested in a book, I don't have it with me, but it's called um, From Witchcraft to Christ by Doreen Irving. And she actually got involved in witchcraft and uh, came out of it and came to Christ. And um, she's written about her experiences in the occult. Um, and it's, it's, a, you know, it's a really good read. Um, and uh, if you'd like to have a, a look at this, you can uh, after the service. Or if you'd like help in ordering either of those books, then um, we can help you out with that as well. So I'd just like to finish by suggesting a couple of things practical things that we can do as, uh, as we close. What can we actually do? Well, the first thing is that we need to turn to the Lord and pray and ask him for, for his help. Because that's, that's the case with anything, isn't it? That we can't accomplish this on our own. And um, We can pray to God and ask him for help in turning to Jesus every day and to turn away from those temptations which... Uh, which we might be, be tempted by, you know, to trust in things other than Jesus. Let's pray and ask God uh, for his help. And if there are things, and I know that um, this may not be a temptation for some of you, but I know for especially younger people it is, that there are things online which are, which are temptations, then there are ways of blocking um, those things and not seeing them. And so you might want to, to investigate that as well, if that's a if that is a temptation for you, just take practical steps so that you're not kind of drawn, drawn into it. But just remember that Jesus is better and Jesus is superior to anything that we might be trust, uh, tempted to trust in apart from him, whether that be the supernatural and the occult or whether that be uh, any other things that we, that we put our trust in, which we can look at another time. Remember that Jesus is better. Be, be a Paul and not an Elimas. And that's the, the big message of, of this passage. Be a Paul, not an Elimas. Now let's take a moment to pray as we close. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that uh, Jesus is better than anything else that, that we might be tempted to trust in. And we pray that you would help us to be, uh, to be like Paul and uh, not like Elimas. We pray that you would help us to trust only in you, to proclaim your word and uh, to, to have the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would help us not to be drawn away um, by temptation to other things, but always to, to fix our eyes on Jesus. So please help us, Lord, uh, this day and every day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.